Okay guys, we need a new infrared space telescope, but James Webb is still 10 years away. What do we do? How do we just develop and build a small one and launch it fast? No, no, no. It's too expensive and it will take too long. The Japanese just launched one. Maybe we can ask if we can borrow theirs. Get out, you're fired. Well, we could just put a telescope on an airplane and fly it up as high as it will go. That should take care of most of the atmosphere. Hmm, that might actually work. Do it. And that is exactly what NASA did. And they named it the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or just SOFIA for short. So they took this big infrared telescope and they put it in the back of an old 747. This is of course a huge engineering challenge with vibrations and how do you keep it aligned to the star that you are looking at. What do you do when you face massive engineering challenges? You call the Germans. And this was in fact a joint project between NASA and the German Aerospace Center. So how do they do it? Well, first of all, they installed a bulkhead at the rear of a 747. Then on the rear side of that bulkhead, they installed a two and a half meter telescope with a big hatch on the side of the hull of the aircraft that could open up to let the telescope look out. Apart from the course main two and a half meter mirror, um, it actually has two secondaries. Maybe it would be a secondary and a tertiary. The first secondary mirror, would just reflect the um, infrared light. All the visible light goes through the secondary mirror and hits the second secondary mirror that then send it into a guide scope. So they're essentially doing like a weird configuration of an off-axis guiding. The light is then passed through the bulkhead and into the main detector that then sits on the other side of the bulkhead. That means that they have easy access to it from inside the pressurized compartment in the airplane. And that means the entire telescope assembly with the cameras on one side and the telescope on the other is balanced around this center bulkhead and can freely rotate inside the bulkhead. And the bulkhead has like shock absorbers to take out the vibration from the plate and all that stuff. That means, of course, that the telescope is only able to turn up and down and not side to side. So the way that they are, they are guiding with this telescope is that the altitude up and down is controlled by just rotating the entire telescope assembly inside the bulkhead. The azimuth is controlled by the plane's heading. Again, it could only look out the left side of the airplane. So as you can imagine, this meant that the plane would have some rather weird flight plans and they need to be carefully planned that you need to have a very specific heading if you want to look at a specific object because you couldn't just turn the telescope. You need to fly at a very specific heading. It must have been a mess making these flight plans, but that's how they did it and apparently it worked quite well. And because it was built like this, it meant that you could change the, um, the science equipment that you were using on the telescope, probably not like on the fly, <laughs> pun intended, but you were able to land the airplane, take the entire camera out, swap it out for another one, make sure it's balanced and then take off again. Frankly, this is genius. You get all the benefits of a ground telescope. It's easy to maintain. You can easily upgrade equipment. And you still get a lot of the benefits from a space-based telescope. You are above 99% of the Earth's atmosphere, so you have very little atmosphere blocking your light. You always have good weather because you're so high up that there's going to be no clouds above you. But why do we even care about infrared astronomy? I mean, we have an atmosphere that's almost perfectly transparent in visible light, and it's right next to infrared. Well, one of the main things we can do with infrared astronomy is look at early stage solar system and, and protostars, or so early stage stars, because when solar systems are formed, it is born inside these nebulae, and the nebulae begin to collapse, and as it collapses, it's a collapsing gas, gas pressure increases, temperature increases, and eventually it reaches the fusion point, and the fusion process begins, and you have what's called a protostar. But the problem is with visible astronomy, we can't really see these protostars because they are inside these nebulae that hasn't yet collapsed into solar systems. So all the visible light is blocked by all this gas around it. And you can easily imagine there's a big, beautiful nebula, but there's an object behind that nebula that you really want to look at. You can't see it because nebula is blocking all the visible light. What do you do? You go infrared. You look at that object in the infrared, that light can easily pass through the nebula and you can see what's behind it. We can use to peer behind the curtain and see what is behind all the dust that is out there in the universe. After the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, Project Sophia was not really needed anymore. NASA now have access to a bigger, better space-based telescope. So the whole project was decommissioned and discontinued in 2022.
SRI 1 had already failed 72 milliseconds before it. So now all of a sudden you have a rocket without an internal rafflesing system. Hold on. Oh yeah, it is. Look at that. That's the old equatorial mount. 